All right, we'll go ahead and get started if everyone is ready. Um, first off, I just want to say good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to be a part of the first ever Agribusiness Assistance Webinar entitled Agriculture and Forestry Environmental Case Studies. And the purpose of this webinar series is to highlight environmental success stories and strategies for various agribusinesses throughout the state and the country while showing how economically feasible sustainability truly is. The series will be targeting the agribusiness sector, open to the general public as well, um, and providing information and education relating to environmental and sustainability topics. This will help to create a network of best practices, as well as recognize the benefits of implementing sustainable practices into the agribusiness sector. Um, this webinar is being put on by the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation in collaboration with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, the Forestry Division, and the Coffee County Soil Conservation District is part of the USDA's Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, my name is Caleb Powell, and I'm an environmental scientist for the Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices at TDEC, and I'll be hosting the webinar today for our wonderful speakers. Um, everyone is muted upon entry to reduce the amount of background noise, but if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to ask them in the chat, and I will work on getting those asked at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and send it a chat message right now. So everyone should be able to see where that chat box is. Um, you can also notice that um, it has a little drop down box where you can send it to all participants. You can send it to just me, the host, or you can send it to all the panelists where our speakers and myself will see that. Um, feel free. Just make sure that you send it either to um, the host or all participants or all panelists, just so I can see that and make sure that I can ask that to our um, speakers. Um, you can also raise your hand with a little hand emoji that should be right um, at the bottom of the participants. Um, and, and if you feel more comfortable asking your question uh, personally, uh, or you know, with, not through the chat box, um, I can unmute you and you can ask that question then. Um, to give you an overview of what's going to be covered today on the webinar, this is uh, the first of two webinars for this year, um, and we'll be highlighting the past two winners of the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award. Um, and, and so we just had the, the judging for this year's GISA. We call it GISA. Um, it stands for the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Awards. Um, and, and the two highlighted um, winners are last year's and this year's in, in the agriculture and forestry category. Um, the attendees, you guys, will have the opportunity to learn about the winning projects and the unique strategies used to make them successful. A um, little overview of the two winners. Uh, the first one is last year's winner. The Tennessee Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry created the Hemlock Woolly. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. Adel Adelgid Strike Team. Uh, Jackie, you're gonna have to help me with that uh, in a little bit to manage Hemlock. Fully, I can't say it, a non-native invasive insect causing in expensive mortality and decline in the eastern and Carolina hemlock throughout the native range in Tennessee. So we're going to learn about their winning strategy to um, help that problem. And then we also are going to hear from the Coffee County Soil Conservation District um, and how they have been instrumental in transitioning from long-term no-till row crop production systems into higher functioning agroecological systems across Coffee County. So um, to give you just an idea, if you don't know about um, GISA or the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Awards, they are presented annually to recognize outstanding achievements by individuals, local governments, businesses, organizations, educational institutions, and agencies for successful environmental projects and conservation measures. The award programs uh, program was instituted in 1986 by Ernie Blankenship of the Tennessee Department of Environment and Health, a predecessor of TDEC, and has been adopted by the governor's office as one of its award programs. These awards are the most prestigious environmental and conservation awards in the state. Uh, for more than 30 years, the awards have been presented in, uh, to individuals and organizations making significant contrib contribute contributions to the protection and improvement of our natural resources and wildlife. So I um, wanted to send a little chat. If you want to know more about the Governor's Environmental Stewardship Awards, um, they happen every single year, and um, we'll be having our luncheon later this year. 
um, where the governor will be handing these awards out. So this, this map right here just sort of shows you where um, uh, a lot of the winners come from throughout the years. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Jackie Broker is works for the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry. She is the strike team coordinator, and there she is right there. You can see her on the video. Um, she is, like I said, the strike te team coordinator for the Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry. She manages the activities of the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, is that right, Jackie? Okay. <laughs> uh, strike team and the prescribed fire strike team. Jackie works for the U.S. Forest Service in their recreation program, tender program, timber program, and fire program, as well as the National Park Service. She received her Master's of Science in Forestry from Mississippi State University with a concentration in forest pests and pathogens, doing much of her research on five needle pine, white pine blister rust, and the mountain pine beetles. Jackie was first hired on with the Tennessee Division of Forestry in 2017 as a crew leader for the HWA strike team. And in 2019, she accepted a permanent position with the division as a strike team coordinator. Away from work, Jackie enjoys running, playing guitar, and being outside. So let me pass this over to you, Jackie. We're excited to hear from you. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm not on mute. Is that correct? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Kayla, for um, that great introduction. And um, thank you for asking. Uh, TDF to attend and present on our Hemlock Woolly Adelgid Strike Team and basically our management, our landscape scale management of HWA. We were really excited to um, receive the 2020 Governor's Environmental Stewardship Award in Forestry. Um, and so I was picked by, my, by the Tennessee Division of Forestry because we have a lot of players um, in the HWA project and program, um, but I was picked to, to to give this presentation since I've been so um, kind of delved into the middle of it, so to say. So, um, so let's uh, so let's get started. Um, I'll tell you all about it. So, before I get into the program workings and creation, um, it's important to mention why the Tennessee Division of Forestry needed to do something about this forest health problem and protect the tree species it was affecting. So the Eastern Hemlock, as you can see, there's a picture there I took in Fall Creek Falls State Park on your right-hand side on that slide. Um, Latin name Suga canadensis is a keystone species that's found in many drainages throughout East Tennessee and the Cumberland Plateau. A keystone species is a species that creates its own ecosystem and provides important ecosystem services that no other species provides in those specific environments. Some of the ecosystem services that the Eastern Hemlock provides um, are uh, shade and habitat for many different fauna, flora, insect, and aquatic species. This shade and habitat also moderates temperature not only during hot months, but throughout the year for both land and water. Hemlocks also protect water quality by providing erosion protection. They're found in these deep, wonderful, beautiful, rocky drainages along streams and rivers. Hemlocks are widely distributed across the forested landscape in the mountains and plateau regions of East and Middle Tennessee. State-owned lands containing hemlock forests are considered some of Tennessee's most unique landscapes. Hemlocks are important to users of state parks, state natural areas, state forests, wildlife management areas, and other public and private lands throughout our state. Uh, in some urban areas, hemlock is one of the more common species planted by landowners, as the presence of hemlock can add significantly to private real estate values. Hemlock forests can be found in 39 counties throughout Tennessee, totaling approximately 150,000 acres which varies from old growth dominant hemlock forests, like you can find in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, to 5% composition in scattered riparian areas throughout Middle Tennessee. Here's a wonderful picture from the 2017-2018 HWH strike team season. This was taken by Nathan Hoover, our forest health and sustainability unit leader. Um, at the time, he was our forest health uh, program specialist. Uh, that's me in the back. Uh, we were finishing a day in Fall Creek Falls State Park, uh, headed out 
at the end of the day. So now that I've spoken about the tree species and the ecosystem we are concerned about, let me tell you about that forest pest that's causing great damage. You can see that um, on this picture I have on the screen provided by the USDA Forest Service. The hemlock woolly adelgid, uh, the Latin name adelgis suga, is a non-native insect causing extensive mortality and decline in eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock populations across Tennessee. You can see what it looks like in this picture here. It's that uh, woolly fuzz on balls kind of on the bottom side of the hemlock branch. Researchers believe it was first introduced from southern Japan sometime in the 1920s. Its impact was first documented in Richmond, Virginia in the 1960s and since then has spread throughout the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, and into the southeastern United States. HWA currently infects about half of the areas of eastern hemlock's native range and has caused extensive mortality in hemlock forests in the Appalachian region. Something to mention here, the southern states seem to be dealing with more decimation than the northern states. And this is due to uh, us down here in the south not having those freezing shocks that the northerners um, usually get. Those freezing shocks usually do a good job in killing off some of that population. HWA was first discovered in East Tennessee in 2002 and has since spread westward to nearly all Tennessee counties within the native range of hemlock. It has traveled quickly, not only due to the rate of population increase, but also with movement of bird migrations. The delgid is a very small aphid that sucks nutrients from hem hemlocks. While feeding on the tree, the tree start, uh, buds start to die off and also a lot of needle loss. The tree usually dies within four to 10 years of infestation, depending on the growing conditions. Usually in wetter sites, it lasts a little bit longer and adelgids don't like sun. So trees that have a lot of sunlight too are usually protected. On the left-hand side is pictured an adult adelgid with its stylus or tongue that it sticks down into the tree at the base of the needle. On the right-hand side, you can see the kind of football black little specks at the base of those needles. That's, a, that's another growing stage of the adelgid. It's in estivation, or also called hibernation. Um, this bug sleeps during the hot summer months um, and starts really get going in the winter months. Um, I like this picture there on the right-hand side because it really shows that each and every needle you see on that picture has an adelgid or two at the base. This is a fast moving pest, partly due to its life cycle. There are two egg laying stages um, throughout the year and each adult can lay up to 200 eggs. Therefore, one adult can create pop a population of about 10,000 adelgids in one year. This bug um, sleeps throughout the hot summer months, as I mentioned before, and usually when you want to check your hemlock trees for it, you have to wait until November through May. That's when you can really see the bugs. Most of the time, you can't see it with just the naked eye. So the potential impact, ecological impacts of this exotic pest are compared to the Dutch elm disease and the chestnut blight, which really took out a whole tree species. This is kind of the same thing that we're dealing with. It was and is apparent that if we leave this unmanaged, HWA will cause great ecological and economic harm in Tennessee and deprive future generations of the opportunity to enjoy this treasured natural resource. One of my favorite trees is pictured there on the right. That's me at the base of the tree. This is in Grundy Forest um, in the South Cumberland State Park along the Grundy Loop Trail. Uh, this was one of our largest trees that we have um, in our database as far as being treated. Now that I've introduced this important forest health issue, I'd like to discuss how the Tennessee Division of Forestry started to manage this, talk about the historical points as well as discuss where we are today. In 2004, Governor Bredesen charged the Tennessee Division of Forestry to form an HWA task force 
and develop a five-year strategic plan and management plan to address the threat of HWA on state lands in Tennessee. This task force was comprised of state land managers from the Tennessee Department of Agriculture, Division of Forestry, Tennessee Department of Environmental Conservation, Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and the United States Forest Service. Um, this is also from the 2000, oh, this is 2018, sorry, I have it wrong on the picture, in 2019 season. Those are three crew members um, standing in Savage Gulf looking over a bluff um, because we had to get down in there uh, to treat hemlocks. Um, and so we were trying to see the uh, decline in hemlock trees at that point. It's one of my, uh, one of my favorite parts of this job is going to places uh, that no one really ever gets to go and seeing some really beautiful parts of Tennessee. So in August of 2010, the task force members and other state land managers attended a national symposium on HWA in, in Asheville, um, North Carolina. The vision of the imminent hemlock forest destruction that, that was portrayed in this meeting led the Tennessee group to put more energy behind the partnership approach. Um, I would like to add that we are still the Tennessee Division of Forestry and therefore um, all of our partners are still involved on the national level with the uh, Hemlock Woolly Delgid Management. That picture was taken on the right in 2019. I gave a presentation at the National HWA Managers Meeting in Holland, Michigan. Uh, by the end of 2011, the, uh, the uh, nature, con uh, well, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. At this point, several important factors needed to be paid attention to. Um, for example, we wanted to make sure that we knew what we were doing as far as HWA, HWA treatment projects, also revising the HWA strategic and management plan and the need for accurate and usable maps and databases, as well as securing additional funding and then conducting outreach. Outreach is something that I find very important with our success. Um, it's made our uh, partnerships stronger, as well as getting the information out to private landowners. This is a picture taken in 2018. Um, it was a workshop that we were holding in Fentress County. Um, so people from Fentress, Morgan, and Scott counties came, and we held it at the Big South Fork Visitor Center. So by the end of 2011, the Nature Conservancy filled a position that provided great leadership and partnership with the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership. Um, and that's how the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership, and excuse me, I'll use the acronym, THCP, was born. Over the next nine years, the THCP would grow to include uh, universities, non-government organizations, um, our government organizations, and most importantly, private citizens. We also have forest industry folks that attend um, this meeting on a regular basis. It became evident when the partnership started trying to manage things that they needed boots on the ground capacity to accomplish the tactical and operational strategies that they were putting forth. So in 2013, the Tennessee Department of Agriculture Division of Forestry wrote a grant to the USDA Forest Service and secured financial assistance to start the HWA strike team. In 2014, the strike team was officially created and the strike team is, it's not a novel idea. Um, other government agencies use this. Uh, more specifically, I'm familiar with uh, wildland fire. They have strike teams of engines and such. Um, but for the forest health realm, this was kind of a novel idea. So we wanted to build an, an, a team that could operate with the sole mission to monitor and treat HWA throughout Tennessee. Over the past six years, HWA strike team has been staffed by three to six personnel. The team is formed each September and operates until the following May. HWA treatment efficacy is maximized in the fall, winter, and early spring timeframe. Therefore, that's why the crew is scheduled to be active during those months. I've added a picture of all the, the crews um, that we've had throughout the years. Uh, each one of those smiling, happy faces on there 
I'd like to say is smiling and happy because they spent a lot of their time in hemlock stands in the middle of nowhere. The TDS, the TDS HWA strike team is part of an integrated pest management plan, or I'd like to use the acronym IPM. An IPM is an ecosystem-based long-term management plan for a specific pest and the damage that it causes. IPMs have been really effective due to the use of a combination of techniques that are used, and also the adaptability so that when things look like they need to be changed up, the land managers can uh, change their methods up. There's something to note here about IPMs. When pesticides are used in this way, there's always a significant amount of research to establish guidelines to use the pesticide for specific targets to minimize the risk to non-target species. HWA strike team plays a large part in the integrated management plan, pest in, integrated pest management plan, where most of their time October, October through May is spent treating trees with chemical. They also assist with biocontrol monitoring, um, monitoring of HWA infestation levels, providing outreach through workshops and participating in the THCP meetings. Here I have on the screen uh, pictures of Nathan Hoover. He's using the umbrella beat the hemlock tree method um, to look for uh, predator beetles. Uh, on the bottom, that's Wolfgang. He's measuring a hemlock tree um, with a DVH tape to determine how much chemical that tree needs to uh, be protected for five to eight years. And then on the left-hand side, that was a really cold day in 2017 um, that we were out in Cumberland Mountain State Park, and that's Lindsay Resler from the 2017-2018 crew. Due to the great success of this approach, the TDF, uh, the TDF HWA strike team or the TDF team hired a full-time strike team coordinator in 2019 to oversee the continuity of operations and provide planning and administrative support to the team. I'm also currently the chair of the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership. And so there's no surprise here, but that's me in that picture. Um, I, I filled that position. And uh, we were really excited that day. We were heading down what they call the cable trail, which was almost like a rock climb um, to treat some rather significant hemlocks at the base of that uh, trail. So the success of the HWA strike team would not be possible um, if not for the strong and active Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership. Um, beginning in August, September area, actually just held the summer meeting yesterday, the THCP convenes in an initial seasonal planning meeting to discuss up upcoming treatment season priorities as well as other activities um, that the crew assists with during the season. This is, uh, there's also a conference like winter meeting um, where we bring in invited researchers, agency representatives, and then um, there's a lot of information sharing that goes on. The pictures you have here on your screen, um, the one on the top is David Arnold giving the opening, um, I don't know, talk for the 2019 THCP winter meeting. This was at Cumberland Mountain State Park. We had over uh, 70 attendees at that meeting. Um, the bottom left, that was the 2020 pre-COVID, um, January THCP winter meeting, um, we had probably around close to 60 people at that meeting as well. There are two very active partners, TDEC and the University of Tennessee. Um, in exchange for hemlock treatment on TDEC lands, they provide the team with lodging throughout the season, which helps tremendously with our fiscal and logistical support. The Lindsay Young Beneficiary Insects Laboratory is um, currently directed by Pat Parkman, Dr. Pat Parkman. And this is where um, they mass produce predators of HWA for release in Tennessee. The HWA strike team provides this laboratory with food for the predator beetles that are being reared in the lab. Um, and then the, it, we also facilitate beetle releases and conduct follow-up monitoring to ensure that beetles are becoming established. 
With the continued support from the USDA Forest Service, the Department of Agriculture, and, the, and our partners in the THCP, the TDA the Division of Forestry will continue to operate the HWA strike team. And as the integrated pest management plan is adaptive, TDF will continue to adjust management methods to try to find the best options to continue to protect, conserve, and enhance our eastern hemlock forest throughout East Tennessee and the Cumberland Plateau. Um, on the bottom left in that picture, we had a workshop with the Hemlock Restoration Initiative from Asheville, North Carolina um, at Rocky Fork State Park. They wanted to learn how to use a tree injection system. So our crew was there teaching them how to do that. On the top right, we had a wonderful workshop in historic rugby. Uh, you can see there are community members there as well as us in our orange uh, forestry vest. So I just wanted to put in a plug here for and give you an opportunity to sign up for the Tennessee Hemlock Conservation Partnership email list, um, where I send out updates, discuss HWA infestations and other important things, and also provide people with agendas and meeting time, dates and times. We have two meetings per year, one in the summer, which is a planning meeting, and then one in the winter, which is more like a conference. If you're interested, the, um, just kind of open up your smartphone and try to use the camera um, and aim at that QR code on your screen. That will take you to a place where you can um, register. And finally, thank you again for inviting me to talk today. Um, my contact information is on the screen and also um, our TDF event satisfaction survey. Um, again, it's a QR code, so if you just aim your smartphone at the screen and try to take a picture um, of that, it'll open up a uh, website and a survey for you to fill out for me. So at this point, I am open to, I'm not sure if we're taking questions, but I'm open to, to questions. Jackie, thank you so much uh, for, for all you do and, and for pulling all this together to highlight the great work that you guys do. Um, and what I'll do is I don't see any questions right now, but feel free to put those in the chat, everyone. And then once we get done with our next presentation, um, we'll open up for questions and I will ask those to our speakers. So thank you so much again, Jackie. And um, next we will go to, let's see, let me pull this over. All right. Our next speaker is Adam Darty, and he is um, the USDA NRCS District Conservationist for Coffee County, Tennessee. He uh, holds a, a Bachelor's of Science in Plant and Soil Science from Tennessee Tech University, a Master's of Science in Biosystems Engineering Technology from UT Knoxville, and he's been with the NRCS for 19 years. He has served as the District Conservationist in Coffee County since May of 2013. Um, when not doing the NRCS gig, he operates a small regenerative farm specializing in fresh market sweet corn and okra. I love okra. He also coaches youth travel baseball and football, and he's an active member of Manchester First Baptist Church. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to you, Adam. Thanks for all that you do. Okay. Thank you very much, Caleb. Uh, can you let me know if you can hear me? We can hear you. Not all right, awesome, awesome. Well, first of all, thanks for uh, thanks for recognizing the Coffee County Soil Conservation District for the Governor's Stewardship Award this year. Uh, there's been a lot of people involved involved in this project, and uh, well, it, it's not really a project; it's just kind of what we do. And was uh, was nominated for this award, and it's a great honor to have that. Uh, I'm just going to kind of go down a little bit of kind of what we do, how we're set up, what the strategy was, and uh, what some of the results are. But but with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and get started. Uh, as Caleb alluded, I'm the district conservationist for NRCS here in Coffee County, and uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, Coffee County Soil Conservation District. Just a little bit of history on 
Soil conservation districts were established way back after the Dust Bowl era from Hugh Hammond Bennett, and I could give a whole presentation on the history of that, but they are actually a functioning part of the Tennessee state government. Uh, there's two appointed uh, board members and three elected officials in the county that serve three-year terms. Uh, within this picture here, uh, standing to the left is Ms. Sarah Hillman. She's the district uh, secretary administrative official here in the office, uh, Ray Weaver, he's the chairman of the board, farmer in the county, uh, myself in the red in the middle. Next to me is Brent Willis. Uh, he's a uh, farmer in the Hillsborough community here in Coffee County. Next to him is Ms. Catherine Garner. She is a district technician and serves for the S Soil Conservation District Outreach Coordinator. Uh, the lady sitting in the glasses, that's Miss Cindy Anderson, uh, business owner, some will feed and grain, uh, farmer in the county, uh, sitting there. Uh, the real bald-headed guy in the center, that's Chris Anderson. Uh, he, he is a cattle producer and row cropper, and his father actually served, he was on the, uh, on the original soil conservation district here in the county served up until his death and served like 56 years on this board. And uh, sitting next to him uh, is Mr. Jimmy Spears. So that's who makes up the Soil Conservation District and the district staff. Not pictured is Alan Wilmore and he serves as the NRCS Soil Conservationist here who works with me out of the county. But just a little bit of history of who the staff is and I guess kind of the personnel that, that received received this award. And how this all kind of came about and, and started, uh, I had worked for NRCS, started my career here in Coffee County in 2002, and had been here for about three years, moved to Franklin County as a district conservationist, then into management with NRCS uh, in the Area 2 office in Murfreesboro. And at about 2010, 2011, kind of got started hearing a little bit about soil health and cover crops and and soil biology. And, you know, most of the folks that's on the board that had went through school or most of our farmers and NRCS personnel in general, uh, you know, we were well versed in the chemical and physical attributes of soil. But this uh, soil, bi soil biology and the living soil was something, something a little new to a lot of us. And uh, so I, I kind of got got introduced to it and got to really studying it and, and, you know, looking at a lot of the things that were going on on farms and in the conservation districts and, and how we were going about addressing resource concerns. And it just happened that uh, in 2013, I was able to return to Coffee County and, and um, where I'd started my career. And we met with the board, the district conservationist board, and some folks, and we, we just, you know, kicking around some of these ideals about, you know, I wonder what's really about this soil health and cover crops. And so we just kind of had a real, you know, set down, you know, hardcore meeting about, you know, really where are we at in, in Coffee County as far as our natural resources. So the way I just try to present this is, is we've all, been at some form of soil degradation. As history will show, you know, we've had a lot of tillage, a lot of destruction to our natural resources, referring mainly to our agricultural soils. And, you know, that was a degraded system. And then, you know, we moved into what's called soil conservation. And, you know, I worked for the natural resources, so, you know, Soil conservation service, and when you go got this word conservation, and, and there's nothing wrong with conservation, uh, you know. But we got to, you know, just being realistic about asking ourselves the question: Why do we want to conserve a degraded resource when it has the potential to be restored? And that's the beauty about what's going on here and what's been done is we've taken something that has been degraded. We, we've helped it a little bit through no-till and some of our best management practices to where we had it conserved. It wasn't getting no worse, but it wasn't really getting a lot better. 
but then we have the realization that we can rejuvenate the, these soils no matter how non-functional they are to to full functioning as they were designed. So that's kind of the mythology of the way the way we thought here at the district with all the parties involved. And it goes down to, you know, we realized that the rejuvenation of this resource does not start with just implementing principles, but we really have to have a commitment to understanding the ecological functions. Us as public servants have to have that understanding, and we've got to find a way to get everybody involved in agriculture to understand this soil, how it's designed to function, and it is part of the ecological process, and it is designed to be a fully functioning, self-supporting ecological system. So we, we really needed to start understanding our whys before our hows. And the overall vision for all the parties involved, it, it was pretty simple, you know, because we were going to be dealing with a clientele of folks who want to do the right thing. Most agricultural producers, they want to, they want to make their land better. They want to grow high producing crops, leave it for the next generations, you know, so they had that integrity already, but what was the missing link? And, and, you know, our vision was real simple. Education, 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 and then we were going to apply some of this stuff that we we're talking about. Then we need to step back and evaluate it and make some adjustments. And then we're just going to repeat. And we're on about the ninth, eighth year of this repeat. And this has been our vision and this has been kind of our strategy the whole time. It's been an extremely based education based deal, which everybody's familiar, you know, NRCS, the districts. A lot of the partners, we have a lot of money to help folks with, but that was not our sole, you know, that was not our sole striving, pushing force is we wanted folks to understand and have an education of why they needed to do something, why it would be helpful instead of just the how part. And, you know, our strategy, uh, the education strategy, I think this is one thing that that really helped this project get off and have the success that we've had here in Coffee County restoring our soils is because number one, the technical folks involved in this, the conservationists, uh, the ones that the boots on the ground working with the producers, they had to know their stuff. We had to, you know, learn enough that we were just dangerous to get this thing going. And then the staff and the supervisors involved, they they had to be on board as well. You know, our end our end user in this is going to be the producers, but they were last on the list because we felt like we needed to get to the industry folks, everybody involved in the agriculture industry here local, as well as the academia uh, influence that we had in the area before we went to the producers. And, and the reason why is because we were fixing to introduce a lot of new ideals, a lot of new, you know, it's hard to break the paradigm shift when something's been working well for a pretty long time how how are we going to you know break in and, and change that and and really you know the producers you know everybody's usually going to ask a second opinion and if we didn't have the industry folks or the academia folks on board with us when those producers went and got a second opinion on some idea that the conservation district was was promoting and industry and academia wasn't on board, then, you know, we're already going to lose those. So that was just a little bit of the strategy of why and the, the order we went in on educating people. And, you know, there's a lot of partners involved in this, the SCD, NRCS, Department of Agriculture, Association of Conservation Districts had a lot of labs involved. So, you know, just a lot, a lot of folks that was involved in this. Just a little bit about Coffee County, where where this is taking place. Uh, Manchester is the main main town. You got Manchester and Tullahoma here in Coffee County, but our row crop we've got about fifty three thousand acres of reported row crop land every year. Ninety nine percent of that's in long term no till. So from a conservation standpoint, from from just a historic as good as you think we could get, we were done there. You know, we get plenty of rain, get plenty of sun, and we've got some inherently good soil. You know, bottom line is this is a good place to grow stuff. 
we get, you know, just good growing seasons, good soil, you know, so, and we were already, you know, kind of a mecca for a conservation and no-till already. So, you know, what was really the problem? So as we started looking at this, you know, why are these long-term, and when I'm referring to long-term, these are fields that have been in no-till production, had not seen any tillage in 25, 30 years. Why were these soils not functioning as they were designed? And a lot of it has come from the way we've been trained uh, as professionals and the way we've been advised as farmers is, is we're always looking at fixing symptoms instead of fixing problems. And the symptoms are is these soils are starved. And the problem is is because the energy that feeds them comes from the sunshine, capturing liquid sunshine, giving off a little bit of oxygen and leaking down liquid sugars and carbon to feed the biology in the soil. Well, we're feeding it six months out of the year when we're growing a cash crop, but then we're starving it to death. You know, we still had some erosion, both surface erosion and vertical erosion, you know, there's terms that's called highly erodible and non-highly erodible field. Well, if that soil is not covered, it may be flat as a pancake, but it's still going to erode. If not running off the surface, it will erode vertically. And, uh, you know, we had low infiltration, had a lot of runoff. Infiltration is not the problem. It was a symptom. problem was is we had a lack of aggregation. You'll hear a lot about compaction. Compaction is not a problem. That's just a lack of aggregation in the soil. And then we didn't have any biological diversity. These fields had seen corn and soybeans, maybe wheat, maybe some cotton, you know, for 30 years, plus a few winter weeds. So when you get to looking at nature and you look at the presentation before from Ms. Jacqueline, I mean, they're going into some of the most highly diverse ecosystems that's left in the state. There's not even monocultures in what they're looking for. And in the forestry industry, you get in a monoculture, you know you're going to end up with problems. Well, our farmland is the same way. The more diversity, you know, you don't have to understand everything and all the synergistic effects, but you can, you know, it's pretty easy to accept that nature's got this stuff figured out and we just need to start managing in her image. So we went about this and, you know, we were tired of addressing symptoms and we was gonna start trying to fix some problems. And the reason why, you know, we address symptoms sometimes instead of fixing the problems, because it's easy to slap a diaper on something. I don't know how many of you have raised kids. I've got 11 and a 15 year old, and they were both in diapers. And, you know, really the crap wasn't the problem. The problem was that it just didn't have enough time with proper management to get them out, feel I can get them out of the diapers. And that's a lot about the way that we treat our farms. And, you know, if you're wondering about diapers, we get to looking at, you know, you see these pictures here with these buffers and these waterways and these things, and, and we think this is good. And, you know, don't get me wrong, there's nothing wrong with them, but these are conservation diapers. The problem is not along the creeks. The problem is what's upslope. What are we doing upslope? So instead of just slapping on a diaper to catch all catch all of our bad management, let's just start fixing the whole field, the whole watershed. Luckily, the solution is pretty simple. The solution's right under our feet. And, mo and most all resource concerns that we deal with in agriculture, the solution's in the soil, the way we manage, the way we treat it. The way the way we get it revived where it's functioning as designed, and the term that's really fixing the problem that we've emphasized is called soil health, and it's it's pretty simple. You know, I give a lot of presentations and a lot of in-depth talks on soil health, but I'm a, I'm just going to keep it real simple right here. And I use this slide a lot of times. Uh, my son, when he is nine, which he's 15 now. Uh, asked him, I said, you know, what's all this soil health stuff that, that I'm talking about, son? And he drew this picture and he said, well, that is pretty simple. He said, all the energy comes from the sun. And it shines on a plant. It leaks a little food down there for the, for the bugs and then gives off a little oxygen. And I said, yeah, that's pretty simple how it works. I said, Brady, what, what happens if the plant's removed? And he said, well, that is pretty simple. It won't work. And that's how simple all this soil health is is keeping 
the soil fed through capturing sunlight, and the only way we can do that is through living plants. And the results we see are pretty pretty significant. This is the same field showing what gains we made in soil aggregation, uh, carbon, biology, and 30 years of no-till in the field versus we start pumping covers to this thing, cover crops to this in two years. So you can see the difference in the aggregation, the color, the soil structure. And why we want to do this is because when we get the soil function as it was designed, we get this long list of results. There's a lot of goods, moisture, temperature, nutrient flow, the list goes right on down to filtering and buffering. It may not always be perfect, but it's going to be a stacked enterprises of goods. And when we get this stacked enterprise, we end up with a resilient resource. If you look at any natural ecosystem, you know, if, if you look at the Cumberland Plateau, you look at any forested area, anywhere that humans don't really have a lot of annual influx, have you ever just sit back and thought, you know, how do these trees grow? How do these grasses grow? You know, there's no co-op coming in there in the middle of the night spreading triple 19 on this. There's a way that these systems are designed to function. And if you can think back over some natural, if you remember like the, the 07 Easter freeze and you could look at the Cumberland Plateau and you could see about halfway up that it was just a distinct killed off line. And now if you look at the plateau right now, you don't see that line. And, you know, the Division of Forestry didn't go in and replant the whole Cumberland Plateau, none of that business. It's nature's resiliency. And we've got to bring more of that back to our farm in our annual production system. Because we know this living ecosystem of the soil contains a lot of stuff, but it is hard to predict availability. And we're not trying to predict availability in agriculture. What we're trying to do is manage the system that it's going to be as good as it can be during any, any climatic condition. You know, when it's hot and dry in a drought, yes, we're going to be hot and dry. Or when we're extremely saturated, we're going to be wet. But we're going to be in better environmental conditions, biologically, health-wise, temperature-wise, moisture-wise, when we have a soil functioning as designed. So here's how we done it. We started with all these long-term no-till fields, started with several producers, and uh, what used to be clean no-till, we started out planting cover crops, a diverse mix of cover crops. We chemically terminated it before, uh, before it got big, and we'd no-till into it just like we had before. So that's kind of what it looked like when we started. This was better than standalone no-till. We had captured some carbon, fed the soil, but we wasn't creating enough biomass that we was going to be able to keep the soil covered throughout the whole growing season. So then we started, you know, getting those results. We evaluate, you know, we applied it, we evaluated, all right, where else can we take this? So then we started growing more biomass. So by years two and three, this is what a, a significant amount of the cropland looked like in Coffee County during planting, where we were planting into larger cover crops, utilizing some tools such as roller crimpers or other ways to get that down. And we were just mimicking nature. If you look at most natural ecosystems, there's going to be a pretty good carbon layer on the ground that's protecting that soil from the rain, rainfall. It's also conserving moisture, and it's also providing habitat for a lot of the biology that lives in that stratosphere surface layer. So as human nature goes, if a little bit's good, a little bit more is better, then we started moving into this, and then, then we started moving into this kind of biomass where we were growing large amounts of biomass utilizing special tools that we were able to secure through grants and help provide for the producers to utilize these manage this biomass and this has become commonplace across over half of the acreage that's planted into corn and soybeans in coffee county every year so from going to clean no-till into mimicking nature with these cover crops was a pretty good paradigm shift for some of the best no-tillers in the world. And if you think about 
if you are a raindrop and you fall, you know, on this corn crop and on that soil surface, think about the difference to all the implications that are that happen with that raindrop from erosion, from moisture conservation, to what biology is available there to utilize that moisture and tap into the organic nutrient cycle as compared to if you just saw a typical clean field or just a bare no-till field. And these are just some pictures of uh, what some of our crops grow. This 30-inch beans growing in this. This shows uh, upper right-hand corner, uh, a planter following a 30-foot roller crimper. All that's matched up on the on the same width. And then we even took it as far as we started integrating livestock back onto the cropland. The livestock, you know, were never, never designed to be removed from the landscape. And uh, so we started working with producers on getting the livestock back on the ground. You know, and just think about, think about in your general passing as you see agriculture land, or if you travel to the Med Midwest or any highly, you know, highly you know, where there's a lot of row crop going on, how many fields do you see that look like this that's being planted? Think about not only from soil, from the soil erosion, from the soil erosion or from water quality, but think about just the overall ecological diversity in this field of cover crops that's being planted as, as compared to mainstream agriculture. And the way we got folks to to buy into this was just a grassroots effort from everybody involved. A lot of education, but a lot of education, it's not just in a classroom setting, it's not just in a meeting. We're actually getting out into the field, working with producers, teaching them how to, you know, what to look at in the soil, showing them where their soils are having issues, showing them how they can be correct, corrected using these cover crops and regenerative agriculture. You know, we've had from small settings where we work with two or three, four or five producers up to we've had field days, uh, you know, where we've had over 400 producers have to start cutting back in RSVP because it just gets so big that we don't have the staff to handle it. And, you know, prior to COVID, we were running five years straight where we had a annual soil health field day that was on average attended by folks from, from at least 10 different states and two different countries each year. So, you know, we we got you know once we saw how well this was working for us, we, you know we educated you know our own. Then we've started spreading it out to other people. You know, and then it's not just they go to a meeting and hear about these crazy ideas and a new way to farm. We actually you know we follow up and work with the producers, spend time in the field evaluating, helping them plant, making sure making sure that they you know they get one shot to get this right every year at planting. So it's not just about, you know, talking the talk. We're actually out there trying to walk the walk with them. Uh, you know, we, de we didn't stop with just the producers, just the folks that's putting us on the ground, trying to give the younger generation a solid education on how the soil is designed to function. And, uh, you know, so that way as they continue their education, they'll understand and go into it possibly where they understand that, that the soil is not just chemical and physical, but it's actually the biology which drives the health of it. You know, once we had some success in this, had some buy-in, you know, it's all right to start promoting it and, you know, telling everybody you can about it because this this is the way that agriculture, mainstream agriculture, we, we feel needs to be. You know, so anybody that called wanting to do articles, you know, the cooperator, a lot of you know, a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts, that kind of stuff. You know, you may have to break out your comfort zone, but it, you know, it's it's for the resource and it, and it's our civic duty to make sure people know about it. Get some, you know, catchy phrases. You know, keeping it squatchy. And I don't know if y'all remember the deals about these random sayings that Sasquatch made. So you know, we came up with one: you got to believe in your soil, if nobody else will. And, you know, just keep promoting it, keep promoting the good stuff, because it's not just the farmers that need to know about this. It's the whole whole community needs to know, because you're not just rejuvenating the, the farm, but when you're keeping all the water clean, making it clean, all the creeks, it does not just doesn't affect what lives in the creek. It, it affects everybody downstream, you know, and and 
the folks that that buy into this and uh you know made sure that they were made sure that they were recognized you know you know they took a leap of faith with some of the ideals we had and it's important that you recognize these folks that uh that have went down this road and been successful because that'll give the other folks more confidence to join in join in with this you know so we saw a lot of anecdotal things that you know we knew were good but it, it's good that we verify we need to verify some of the things that's going on this graph shows just from where we kind of started on this journey with the community some of the biological measurements some of the analytical stuff that we were increasing on where we were create we over a three-year study we done across 58 fields with 17 producers covering about 2200 acres we had a seven-fold increase in our one-day CO2 burst. We doubled our soil health calculation, our phospholipid fatty, fatty acid analysis. That's basically just a measurement of a mass in nanograms of the biology to a gram of soil. Had uh, doubled and tripled nearly in some cases uh, where we were integrating livestock. We were getting even higher biological measurements so you know it was showing that it was good you know to be able to validate we were telling people it was good to integrate the livestock back in but then this starts you know kind of showing some of the ways that we're able to put some numbers on what we're seeing you know the water extractable carbon from where we started to the three years later you know this worried me a little bit but basically what this shows is once you start planting the cover crops and doing this in the fields we end up increasing the biological population so much so quick that it's hard to keep enough carbon in the system to keep them fed now that we've continued testing in some of these fields this has started to reach an equilibrium where we're not where we're able to keep everybody fed and keep all that working pretty good you know you hear a lot of stuff about how important soil temperature and infiltration rate is on our cropland fields and this is you know some data we took just verifying with these producers showing them the different different production systems where, where we're mimicking nature and managing this biomass how how we're keeping the soil cooler and how we're infiltrating way much more water as compared to our other farming systems you know what does this resiliency look like on a large scale and where did it come from the two fields here the holy grail has not seen any tillage and since it was cleared in trees in the 1940s. The green bean field was cleared in the 40s as well, but you know, commercial traditional farming without no-till and stuff into the 80s, the Holy Grail field was in grass until the 80s. We brought the Holy Grail field out of grass in 2013 and started planting covers in it. And this just shows the comparison of these fields across different climatic conditions. And this is what we're looking for with our producers with resiliency. In 14, we had great growing conditions, had a big yield on the on the Holy Grail field. In 15, we were dry as the 13 bushel spread in beans. In 16, we were really dry. This field set through D4 drought conditions. It spent 60 days, continuous days above 90 degrees. And look at the spread difference in the corn yield. In 17, we were wet, uh, had a 20 bushel spread on beans. And in 18, we were real wet and uh, still had a 25 bushel spread on corn. So it shows under all climatic conditions, you know, we got the good times, the dry times, and the wet times. And that takes care of about all the times of farming. But we was able to be profitable, fill the bins during all those years, as well as having a take you better care of the resource but you know we're not done we've got the, the soil health part down as far as how we're managing in the fields now we're expanding looking at the entire ecosystem of that field trying to look at more additional reductions in pesticides and insecticides so we're looking at beneficial insect habitat pollinator habitat Looking at implement, we just recently awarded a grant through the Tennessee Department of Agriculture to start looking at setting up some hooded sprayer strips. We will burn down some of the strips of cover crops, let the middles grow, and plant our cash crops in into the uh, burnt down strips. 
looking at getting away from more and more getting away from just the traditional fertilized methods with the dry blanket applications looking at a lot of biological in furrows it's it's a lot less salt uh, also we have some chelated forms you know just a lot of stuff where we can go into the organic nutrient cycle a lot quicker better crop results and better on the biology and then you know it's time for us to start our producers to start looking at their direct marketing they're growing a higher quality product more nutrient dense uh, a lot less invasive on some of the environmental concerns that come from large-scale agriculture it's time that you know they have a premium product that has premium benefits that it's time to start looking at getting a premium premium profit out of those products and with that I'm gonna wrap it up uh, from you know I'm just I'm just the spokesperson for everybody involved in this but from everybody I'd like to you know sincere thanks for letting us share our story with you and Caleb I'll turn it back over to you buddy Adam, thank you so much. Number one, for just all that you do for our resources, um, but also, uh, you know, I had, I really didn't have that much of an idea of how much, you know, I think a lot of people, when you think of, of uh, row crops and, and farming, they think, you know, you just plant the, the seeds, water it, and then you got our crops, but there's so much more that goes into it. And I just really appreciate all the work that you guys have done. Uh, and and for pulling this presentation together so that we can hopefully teach more people about it. Um, I have a we're we're a minute over, but I, I did want to ask. There was a couple questions that came in. Uh, Jackie said, uh, "How many states that have large areas of eastern hemlocks have programs like ours? Is there any types of programs in other states like ours?" Yeah, that's a fantastic uh, question. Thank you. So HWA is affecting all. Um, kind of north, eastern, and, and southern states along the coast, including places up in Canada and Nova Scotia. And so there are um, currently, Kentucky has a strike team, Michigan has a pseudo strike team, and there are other states that have reached out to me um, to kind of assist in helping them come up with a plan on how they can create their own strike team. So um, thankfully, we were, uh, the state of Tennessee, um, because of how uh, uh, we were seeing the decimation in North Carolina and the Great Smoky Mountains of Eastern Hemlock, we jumped it on it quickly. Uh, so we were able to develop a program. So as I mentioned in my presentation, um, HWA is not really affecting Northern states as it is affecting us down here in the South. Uh, at the same time, they are seeing damage. Um, it is a problem that's not going to go away, and we need to get ahead of it. So I'm very thankful that states are reaching out to, to us to help them with their program. And then one last question. Uh, I don't want to take too much time on this, but uh, we had for a question for both of you guys. It says, what, were, what was, like, the biggest challenge faced um, in these projects, and then how did you navigate that? I don't know if you want to go first, Adam, or Jackie. Or Adam, you, Adam, you can go first. Okay. Uh, just, just the biggest challenge is, you know, producers here in this area have been very successful uh, economically just with long-term no-till. And we were looking at, you know, changing the paradigm and adding adding a complex hit, you know, something very complex that's just a logistical nightmare of trying to get covers planted while you're harvesting a crop and then just the added uh, complications that it comes to manage them during planting season. That was the biggest paradigm shift, just getting folks to take that leap of faith. And then the next biggest was once we started going into the higher biomass, making sure we had the infrastructure and the equipment in place to be able to handle the larger amounts of biomass as opposed to lower biomass or the clean no-till. Um, our biggest our biggest challenge with this program was the landscape in which we had to send, you know, a, a three to six person crew um, down into. And so um, safety uh, and logistics in order to get the crew all of the gear and everything that they need in order to um, treat hemlocks in these crazy, amazing, beautiful, steep, slippery, wet places. That I think is our continuing challenge we do um, 
provide them with wilderness first aid training, um, and we do provide them with two weeks of intensive boot camp training. Um, but it, it takes a, a great person uh, who is interested in an adventure uh, to do this physically challenging um, activity. So. Well, uh, Adam and Jackie, you know, it's, it's easy to see why um, your projects won uh, a Governor Environmental Stewardship Awards and, and you know, it's, I'm so appreciative for that we that the state and you know the country's got people like you uh, fighting for um, agriculture and forestry um, conservation. So um, once again, I want to thank you guys for taking time to tell everyone about your projects. And also, I'd like to thank everyone for being uh, being here and registering for um, for the webinar. This webinar is being recorded, and the presentation slides will be available on our website. Um, and then let me see. Um, and and I'll, I'll put the uh, website link for our um, agribusiness assistance program in the chat in just a second. Uh, if you have any questions about anything that was talked about, or you have any questions for the presenters that you didn't get to ask, please contact me at caleb.powell, that's C A L E B dot P O W E L L, at tn.gov. Um, and then next week, we'll, I'll be sending out a follow up email. Um, that will have some more information about it. Uh, the, I just wanted to promote our new program. The Agribusiness Assistance Program is a new collaboration between the Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices and the Small Business Environmental Assistance Program. We have a website where you can uh, find our past and upcoming webinars uh, in this series, and, um, and then also some resources to assist our great agricultural sector um, here in Tennessee. I'm going to go ahead and put this in here for anybody that wants to go check that out. Um, and then our, our next webinar uh, in the series is going to be covering helpful resources that we have in the state for the agriculture and forestry sector. Uh, be on the lookout for the registration link and invitation email for that. Um, more information will be included in that follow-up email that we were talking about. So thanks, everyone, and have a great week.